Mit tettél ebédre? Sziasztok, én Pásztori Dóri vagyok, és abból az apropóból vagyunk ma itt, hogy a napokban jelenik meg az Open Books kiadó gondozásában Edith Éva Éger az Ajándék című könyvének új, bővített kiadása egy csodálatos ünnepi díszkiadásban. Bár Edi nagyon szerette volna Budapesten bemutatni a könyvet, erre nem volt lehetőség, de én nagyon-nagyon hálás vagyok, és igazán megtisztelő, hogy így online beszélgethetünk egy kicsit, és ahogy látjátok, nem egyedül van, hanem itt van vele a lánya, ez egy nagyon különleges alkalom, Miriam Ingle, aki klinikai szakszichológus, gyermekekkel és serdülőkorúakkal foglalkozik, valamint elismert sportpszichológus is. Sokat dolgozik iskolákkal, edzőkkel és ifjúsági sportolókkal, valamint elit és profi sportolókkal és csapatokkal is. Oktatói és kutatói pozíciókat tölt be egyetemeken és szervezetekben, ezen kívül a Beyond Expectation című sportpszichológiai kézikönyv szerzője. Férje Robert Ingle Nobel-díjas közgazdász, és az ajándék című kötet 14. kiadását együtt írták. Erről fogunk most beszélgetni. Nagyon-nagyon sokat fog szó esni ételekről, ízekről, mindenféle emlékről. Én most angolra fogok váltani, de bármikor, amikor úgy érzitek, nyugodtan válaszoljatok magyarul, és nagyon-nagyon örülünk minden magyar szónak, de így egyszerűbb mindenkinek. So, the new edition of your book, Gift, includes family recipes collected by you two together. I think sharing Valkap family recipes with your readers, it's a really special gift. It's personal, it gives a little bit of insight into your heritage, your culture, and it also could be really useful when planning a festive menu. You can tell a lot about yourself through food and how you eat. Are you a slow eater or do you prefer fast and easy solutions? Eating gives you joy, or you eat to support your body with enough nutrition. Are you a cooker or a baker? Do you prefer comfort food, home cooking, or fine dining and restaurant experience? Are you open-minded and taste different foods, or do you prefer similar or well-known flavors? So let's start here. How would you describe your foodie personality? Eddie. <laughs> oh, I love food of any kind. If you take me to a restaurant, I eat my food, your food, and what you leave there, I'll take it home. I, I cannot throw out a piece of bread, but I was in Budapest and the Gyulai and this, uh, the Kolbas is mindent, mindent. Uh, nagyon-nagyon élveztem. A legjobb volt a libamáj, ami, ami, ami olyan, olyan jó volt, és, és én nagyon szeretek Magyarországra menni, és az elnök itt volt nálam, és nagyon-nagyon örülök, és mindig, mindig remélem, hogy fogunk találkozni nem sokára. How about you, Marianne? Are you a home cooker? Or do you enjoy restaurants, baker or cooker? So um, I grew up eating my mother's delicious Hungarian food. And um, the only thing was that she made the most disgusting hamburgers ever because she filled them with vegetables. So, you know, all these things that now as an adult I see was pretty delicious. It just didn't match the American uh, hamburger. Um, When I went to college, I thought, oh, good, now I'm going to really figure out what American food is like. But after a few weeks of eating in the dorm, I came home and said, oh, mom, you can't imagine what that food is like. Anyway, as time has gone on, I became a cook myself and I wrote a food column in addition to the other things. And our family loves to eat. We all love to cook. We love to go out to brand new restaurants, old restaurants. I mean, It's really pretty hard to make us unhappy with food. Um, and so doing this part of the book, um, when I was doing my um, 
weekly food column, I decided to do a Hungarian series. And I got my mother to write to all of her friends and send me recipes. And then I tried them all out and, and published them. And so I took a lot of those in addition to ones that we've developed since we've, you know, grown up in America. So there's, there's a combination of recipes in here. Um, I think they're pretty good. I think uh, a lot of people like them. So I hope your readers try them out. And I actually put a little web page on there. So if they want to write me and tell me, they can write me in Hungarian. Uh, that would be like amazing. So I which make ingredients? A good mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, I love the Seke goulash recipe in it. So which is the food you are usually making your new friends or people who just get know to introduce the Hungarian cuisines and meals? I make the chicken paprikash, nakar liver, uh, and I also make uh, uh, pasta with Kaddish cheese, and um, many people just love that, very simple and very tasty. Yeah, and, and I make it as she used to uh, with bacon also. So, you know, it's, it's um, there, there's a name for it in Hungarian. What's it called? Um, Hungarian. Oh, we call it noodles and cottage cheese in our family. But it's, um, I think it's, yes, exactly. It's an old, old sort of farmer's dish. Yeah. And uh, all the grandchildren are raised on it. Um, it's really, you know, there's so much that's good, but those are the favorites. A with sugar or with bacon? It's always a really important question in each Hungarian family. Yes, well, with that for us, it's with bacon. Okay. I haven't tried, actually, you know what? I never tried it with sugar. I always had it with sugar, yeah, on the really? top. Yeah, yeah, you should try it. It's really delicious because cottage cheese just goes really well. We have this cottage cheese dumpling as well with sour cream and sugar, and it's really, really great. That one I love, yes. Yeah, chicken paprikash, nagyon finom. They in all, in all chinalok, uh, um, garlic. Uh, garlic chicken. Garlic chicken as well. Okay. And it's very, very good put garlic uh, and paprika and put it in the top of the chicken and bake it and uh, and make it with torhanya. Torhanya, lehet it kapni. That recipe is in the book. Yeah. The torhanya is. The torhanya, mani shevit shinaya itten. Which ingredients are the hardest to find to substitute in California when you are making traditional Hungarian meals? Um, well, you have much better cottage cheese than we do. You've, you've got the real deal. And um, I think that I think, but other than that, we're pretty good. Um, but if you can find Torhonya in California, it's a really good start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you can, you can. So oh, Marian, it's called the... noodle barley by Manishevitz. Right. Oh, like yeah. Noodle barley. Okay. It's really useful, I think, for for your Hungarian <laughs> read. A chirki nekal, a levit, ra ented, is az nagyon fin. I'm hungry now, already. <laughs> so, Marian, in Edith's first book, you were the baby. And in this. The baby in the book. Yeah, in this new edition, you created something together. How did you find working with your mom? And have you ever worked together before? So my mother had always wanted to write a book. And it, um, it just, you know, it, it's not easy to figure out how to get it done, what the best way is. And one of her friends, who is a professor at Stanford, said that her story needed to be told and he had a person who could help us um i think he was an old student of his and um so he re so i interviewed with doug originally in new york actually and after he heard my mother's stories he said we have a book and so we got a writer to help us and that's how it all began so i've actually been involved with this from the very start and um, I've worked with my mother from the very beginning. Um, 
and it has been really thrilling to do it because um, I think she needed a lot of support with the first book because going through those experiences of um, losing her parents in Auschwitz and surviving Auschwitz and not being able to be an Olympic athlete as she had hoped and moving to America. I mean, you know, all these things were very emotional for her and especially around the Holocaust. And, and so she, she needed, you know, me to sit there and, and, um, I heard stories that I'd never heard before my mm -hmm. sister came and helped. Um, so in, in some sense, this is a family project. Um, but with the second book, after it was done, um, I really wanted to do a cookbook, just desperately. And because I just felt like that's so much a part of who my mother is. And, um, and because also my interest in food writing and all that. So I went to the publisher and I said, let me do a cookbook. And they thought about it and they came back and they said, okay, how about two new chapters <laughs> in the second book? So that's, that's how that happened. And that was really fun because we redid all the recipes and I got to cook directly with my mother. Uh, we don't always agree on every single thing, if you can imagine, but uh, you know, it was great, really great. And I love being with her now. It's so much fun. I just like to say that for many years, people told me to write a book and I would say automatically, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. And then Philip Zimbardo called me one morning and said that the people who survived and famous are all men, that they need a female voice. And that's how the first book came. It's the female voice of Viktor Frankl. But I'm not Viktor Frankl and he's not me because I was 16 year old in love in Auschwitz and he was a medical doctor already in his studies. So we were there in a different time in our lives. And he said he will lecture in Vienna if he survives. And, and I would say that if I survive today, I'm going to see my boyfriend and we're going to go to Palestine and we're going to fight. <laughs> we were, you know, you know, we were not so peaceful. We wanted to go to Palestine and fight. Unfortunately, he was killed the day before liberation. You mentioned food many times in your bestseller book, Choice, and how playing the idea of making food and arguing about recipes in the death camps gave you strength and peace of normality. Visualization and using your imagination is a well-known method in psychology. I used a lot as an elite athlete as well. But you didn't have to learn that. You just had it in you as a 16 years old girl fighting for her life every day, that this could help to survive. How common is that, that someone naturally has this gift to use their mind as a powerful resource? I remember I would ask myself, does anyone know that I'm here? I felt so thrown out as if I have done something wrong. I didn't realize that this was an opportunity for an opportunity to discover my inner resources. I think dependency can breed depression when we wait for someone to liberate us or wait for someone to make us happy. And I think that I have learned to turn suffering to become stronger. So it was a learning process for you as well. It was a schoolroom, yes. And I learned what not necessarily to do, but what not to do. Because if you touch the guards, you were killed right away. If you touch the barbed wire, you were electrocuted right away. So you had to learn the rules and uh, and and just learn that every day, every day, hopefully, 
will get you closer. I never even imagined that I'm not going to get out of here. It was just a question of time. Marianne, what is your experience in your practice? Well, yeah, I, I, um, I just want to say a thing first about my mother. You know, I think she was um, a child who um, she felt like she was, you know, the third girl who was not exactly the father was hoping for a boy. And um, um, she was an incredible athlete from early on. And she um, she was also an incredible student. And I don't think she ever stopped to think that that was special. I mean, she always felt like her two sisters were the special ones. And she had a problem with her eyes and she needed surgery and, and she was teased because the way she, um, cross -eyed. she was cross-eyed. And, and so I think she was used to not being the um, favorite of everybody's, except for her coaches, um, mm -hmm. who, who did make her feel that way. And I think that helped. But she was used to, to being tough and stick with things and, and just take responsibility and move forward. And one of the things my mother has said is that the kids who are really spoiled, who came to the concentration camp, did not have the, the ability to foresee that they could actually survive. My ballet uh, man who taught me a word, and he said that... Uh, ecstasy i remember he, he mentioned the word <laughs> how you find ecstasy in life and when i was in auschwitz i remembered that word that i still can turn the hatred into pity and feeling sorry for the gods so if i would have died probably you would have seen me praying for the gods do you think that strength come from your sport past or your experience in sport before the war? I used to practice at least five hours a day and then I was asked to train someone else because I am Jewish and so I had to train someone else who was a Gentile. And not as good. As far as with my work, I feel like the, the thing that happens to athletes, I'm sure it happened to you, is that there's always this moment where you feel like this is not going well. I'm not doing as well as I wanted to. Um, and what you do with that makes all the difference. You know, if you can say, okay, I'm not doing well. There's a lesson to be learned here. I'm not going to learn it this minute. I'm just going to get myself back in the race and do as well as I can. It's just the best I can do. And 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 so you take it and you move on, or you don't take, or you don't, and you get depressed and I'll never be as good. You know all the things people athletes can say to themselves, and then they start to go downhill, and and that's very very powerful and uh, painful for everyone to watch and for them to feel. I like to also mention, um, maybe people can relate to it at the audience, that immigrants' children, you know, the question I ask, when did your childhood end? Because immigrants' children get parentized. You know, Marianne, I remember, uh, told me about peanut butter and tuna fish. I've never seen that in my life. So the little girl, is really becoming a, a little adult. I have a son, he is nine years old. And I remember the moment when first time he told, oh, sorry, my mom is not speaking very good English. <laughs> and I thought, oh. I really try. <laughs> oh. So I can relate to that, yeah. Yes, the little girl. Uh, the, the other question I asked, so the first question, when did your childhood end? But the second question is, would you like to be married to you? It's a really powerful question. Yeah. I'm sure you would like to be married to you. You're fun, you're intelligent, you have a brilliant mind. 
and a very warm heart, I'm sure. Oh, thank you so much. My husband seems happy, which is a good sign, I guess. <laughs> it gave me confidence to say yes to this answer, yeah. So, Marian, being a child is an, in an immigrant family should have a big impact on your personality, as your mom mentioned, and on your identity. So, you didn't know your mother's story till you were 12, is that right? That's right, that's right. So, I knew, how, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. How does your self-reflection change over the years and after this knowledge about the story of your mom? You know, I knew that I didn't have grandparents. And so I knew that something had happened in the war. I didn't know my mother's story. And, um, you know, I think basically I was so... Um, I love life and I loved it as a child and I liked having friends. I liked doing different activities. I, you know, and I didn't see that that was different when I got to be a teenager and I could see that other families were doing things maybe a little differently. And, um, some of my friends were friends with other people because their parents had been friends and their grandparents had been friends or that sort of thing. And that, that was really much more the time that I started to hope to question the whole immigrant thing of, uh, you know, is there a place where people would know who I am or would, because I, I knew I came from really lovely families. So, I, so I, just I minute. have to say that, what? that, um, that Marianne went uh, to her school to a dance and I bought her a beautiful orange dress. And my late husband said, go, honey, have fun, because at your age, your mother was in Auschwitz. I thought I'm no. going to kill and, and her parents are dead. We're dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So imagine that. I thought I'm, <laughs> how can you, how can you talk like that when she's dressed beautifully going to a dance? I just wanted to be a Yankee Doodle Dandy. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to assimilate and I ran away totally from the past. And then uh, I began to recognize that if I'm not going to do it, then who will? Because I lectured at the university and I realized that people had no idea that there was a place called Auschwitz. And I considered it my responsibility. I still do to do everything in my power to see to it that will never happen again. How do you remember of that, Miriam? You know, th th these are scary times now. And I think being the parent of a survivor makes it even more frightening um, because I see my mother's reactions when government people will, you know, not care about, um, well, you know, it's not just Jews. It's, there are so many different groups of people who, who are made to feel like they are um, easy, to, easy to kill and, mm -hmm. and desirable to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes actually now that I've gotten older too, I think about what is it about humans that through the centuries, we find ways to believe in things that we can then kill other people because they don't. You know, what is it about, about human, human development that uh, we're the one um, group of animals that really wants to hurt other people? Um, I don't understand it. And, and I mean, what I do understand about it, I don't like, so I prefer, I would prefer not, not to have it happen. I but like it does. to tell you really, I like to interrupt, I'm sorry. But when I came to America, I worked in a factory. And then finally, I decided I'm going to go to the bathroom because I got paid seven cents a dozen. So I didn't want to miss the time. But when I came to the bathroom, one of them said colored. And I realized that I came to America, find democracy, and I found prejudice. Prejudice means to prejudge. 
So I joined the NAACP, I joined Martin Luther King, and I said, we shall overcome with the mamas and the papas. And I think the year was 1962 or three, 1963, when, uh, when I was singing, we shall overcome, and I got a hug from Martin Luther King. I can imagine how disturbing it could be to you to watch what's going on now in Ukraine and all over the world. And it's really, really difficult. So a winter ahead of us will bring a lot of difficulties for many people all over the world. And the ability to adapt to change, believing in our choices and the fact that we always have choices is so important. And your books are all about that strength and experience. But if you could summarize your advice to our listener who experience hopelessness, loneliness, or difficulties to keep their spirit up, what would it be? Eddie. Well, I, do, I remember that mother teresa was here at scripts and when she came to she looked at my doctor larry klein and she asked him do you know my jesus and larry was stuttering hammering that didn't know what to say and finally he said mother teresa i don't know if i know you jesus because i'm jewish and she responded that's wonderful because my Jesus is Jewish too. So I guess we all come from that family. And, uh, and, um, and I think that never in the history of mankind, you know, we have genocide as we speak, but never in the history of mankind, such a systematic and scientific annihilation of people uh, existed when they celebrated that uh, in the evening that they can put 30,000 Jews in the oven in one day. It's not comparable. No. You know, to think about the listeners who are suffering from depression and, and anxiety and life feels hard for them. And you wonder whether the next day is worth it. Um, you know, you have both of our sympathies. We know that these feelings exist and they are very painful. And sometimes they look like they're not fixable. But the truth is that inside every one of us, there is a potential and a ability to think hard about something you can do for yourself, for the world, during the next day, you know, everyone can change. It's, it's not that you can have the worst experience every single day. There's some joy everywhere. And if you can acknowledge that you have problems finding joy, but that there are ways to do it and get help if you need it, certainly read my mother's books. I think they have changed. I mean, we know from letters we get and the course that they're doing online now, which uh, has been so beautiful that uh, she does with, with my son. Um, and the responses that we're getting are that, thank you, I can make it through another day. So I think that's the advice I would give. I, I don't know if I have time to tell you very quickly that I began to work with what's called today post-traumatic stress disorder stunt a disorder, it's really a reaction to a loss. And I had these two paraplegics coming to see me and one of them in a fetal position. Why me and blaming everything, everyone, God, country, you name it. And conversely, the other one said to me, hey, hey, I am in a wheelchair and I am so blessed because I can see my children's eyes much closer. Same thing happening. 
two entirely different responses. And that's when I realized that I was wearing a white coat. It says Dr. Eager, Department of Psychiatry. And I felt like a total imposter. And I went back to Auschwitz. I asked my sister to join me and she told me I'm an idiot. So we had a very different way of, uh, of coping with that part. Today, that's my work. Revisit the places where you've been, relive that experience, but then you revise your life. You don't set up household there. You know, I am not a victim. I was victimized. I don't forget it. I never overcome it. I don't know what that means, overcoming. Because I know when I went to have steak at Roots, it triggered the time when children were spitting at us, walking in Germany and calling us very, very bad words. So you're going to have something that will trigger something that may have happened in your family of origin. And I think that's why it's good to work with someone who can revisit the places with you, holding your hand and recognize you're not stuck there. You were victimized, but you're not a victim. It's really, really important. And festive season is ahead of us. So a lot of families is coming together. How family members can support each other to deal with trauma? And how should families open up about their traumatic events in the family? Well, it is great for families to get together. We're having Thanksgiving, an early Thanksgiving here at my mother's house tomorrow. Um, and our I'm kids. making mashed potatoes, but it's really cream and butter with potatoes, not the other way around. They are the best, the best, the best. And, um, and then on Thursday, which is Thanksgiving, my husband and I are going to Seattle to be with his nephews um, because both of their mothers who were twins died of cancer and we want to be with them. You know, I think, I think the beauty of holidays is that it is a time to show love and support and connection because we're all so busy. I don't know how it is in your family, but our family is incredibly busy all the time. And as, and as some of the grandchildren get older, I mean, if we want to see them, we have to, uh, you know, be willing to go to different games and do <laughs> all these things because their lives are busy and, and they can't come to us. So, you know, I think families have to figure out what's important to them and then actually act on it and not expect that other people are going to do this or that for me because they should. Should is a, not one of my mother's favorite words, I can tell you. Um, I think one of the questions, actually a newspaper um, put an article out today or yesterday from my mother about what do you do when there's a lot of conflict in your family and you are going to be together. That's a tough one because what you would hope, of course, is that both people with the conflict would just shut up, excuse me, and uh, stay quiet about that and be there for the family and be there for the other people. and. But oftentimes there's just one little thing and then one person gets going and the other person gets going and then that, you know, it, it, it just gets worse. And, and I, I would desperately hope that anyone who's listening, who has a conflict with people in their family, the holidays are about the love part of family. They're not about the conflict. Do the conflict later. Figure out how to love each other now. And it's so beautiful that it brings generations together. And I have heard yes. your grandson is over there and you work on a project together. He's so right Jordan He's can right here. join us and share this project. I would love to hear about it. Hello, nice Hello. to meet you. So Edie and I, I'm, I am the, I'm Marianne's son and um, Edie and I always had a very, uh, 
Spanish. unique, yeah, unique relationship. I, I'm not sure why it was and, and the nature of it, but there was something there always with us, like a, a depth and um, and a sweetness. The, the sweetness between the two of them was always just adorable. And uh, and I knew that if Jordan had something really important in his heart that he didn't want to tell any of us, he could tell my mother. Yeah, she would. Edie, Edie has been my confidant for a long time and, and a very good uh, truth teller to me in my life. Thank God, mm -hmm. because otherwise he wouldn't be married today, but, <laughs> but he really belongs. So I'm glad everything turned out just right. Um, she, she, she guided me to be with uh, the right woman. And, uh, is, you know, the thing about Edie is she will tell it to you very directly. And she's softened in some ways but the the truth is the truth to Edie, and she is wonderful about making you understand it and usually come to terms with it which is which is one of her wonderful skills so the reason that we did the course is there was we had the realization that so many people were reading the gift and were having breakthrough moments and then they'd put the book down and they'd move on with their life and what we see in psychology, and my mom's a psychologist, Edie's a psychologist, is that true transformation usually takes a handful of sessions and you, you come back to this work over and over again. And then as you work through the problem and you understand it, you're able to move on to a different way of, of living your life. And so these books were, were moving people, but then they would finish the book and they'd move on with their life. And so the gift was sort of a roadblock, a road uh, map for what the course is. And the course is called Unlocking Your Potential. And it's about a lot of the exercises from the gift and a lot of other unique exercises that Edie has, has created throughout her life. And it takes 10 modules. It's a, it's a process. It's work. And in each module, there's a workshop side of it. So there's a journal associated with it. We're actually creating a beautiful journal and there's guided visualizations so you go on a, on a journey uh, throughout each module where you close your eyes and you're you go and you meet a, a grow, future grow to the valley of the shadow of death That's right. you go through it and, and that process get out of, it. of going of going into your self subconscious and looking at yourself and seeing what's in there where where's the you know, where's the rot? Where's the where's the growth? And focusing on how to get more of the growth in your life seems to be very powerful for people. I am not a I'm not a shrink, I'm a stretch. Definitely. So it's accessible it's for everyone, right? This program. Yeah. It is accessible for everyone. And um, we we even did a another course, a small course, which we shot right here behind us in this room on forgiveness. Uh, we were getting a lot of feedback from people that they wanted more about forgiveness, that that was the first step that needed to be taken. So we did this beautiful course, which is sort of an opening to the master class, if you will, on forgiveness, which is available. And that's a very affordable. It's I think $15 is the is the cost for that course. And that's a wonderful place to start. Uh, to just get immersed into the the course, uh, the way a course works and how that process is versus reading a book. I think it's a brilliant gift idea to everyone before Christmas. And it's a real gift to see you three together on the screen. So thank you so much for your time and have a beautiful, beautiful festive season ahead of us. And it was really, really great to meet you. Thank you so much. Köszönöm szépen. Nagyon szépen köszönöm. Nagyon, nagyon örülök, hogy találkoztunk. Én is nagyon örülök. Even, even oceans are between us. Your power and your strengths are coming through the screen. So I really, really feel it. So thank you so much. Én is nagyon szépen köszönök minden. Happy holidays to you too. And thank you so much. Um, it's it's uh, such a pleasure to have Hungarians actually acknowledge and understand my mother at, at this stage of her life too. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I see them, my dad. Hello, Kim, my dad.